Welcome to The Skill Shift, a podcast for organizations that want to future ready their workforces, brought to you by D2L. I'm your host, Malika Astana, Senior Strategy and Public Affairs Manager. Each episode, we'll speak with guests from some of the most innovative businesses around the world about their unique approaches to learning and development. They'll share specific, actionable insights into how they're preparing their workforces for the future and the ways they're addressing skills gaps in their industries. You're listening to The Skill Shift. Our guest this week is Matt Siegelman, president of the Burning Glass Institute and chairman at Lightcast. He has dedicated his career to unlocking new avenues for mobility, opportunity, and equity through skills. He's a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and holds an AB from Princeton University and an MBA from Harvard. Matt, welcome. So great to be together. Absolutely. Um, So Matt, let's get right into it. You were considered one of the original leaders of real-time labor market data, a breakthrough innovation that has transformed the way that people understand and plan for the world of work. Uh, Can you share a little bit about how that field has grown and what that means for businesses and workers alike? So first of all, let me just define terms. When we talk about real-time labor market data, it's a bunch of of words there. And, And I actually have come to believe it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, mm-hmm. Not that it's not accurate, but it's it's maybe not even reflecting what's most important and, and um, revolutionary about this approach. So it used to be, um, and I bet there's some people out in the audience who remember this, used to be that if you wanted to understand the labor market, you had to go and get um, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and their uh, occupational projections and things like that, which when you're planning your workforce, Um, whether it's planning where do you find people, whether it's planning um, what skills they need. Um, Those kinds of projections are nice. Those kinds of uh, data series are kind of interesting, but they weren't granular enough Mm -hmm. um, to give you a basis for action. The breakthrough innovation that we brought to the market was the realization that um, you actually can really see most hiring transactions that happen in, in, a, in a major economy today. Uh, and that's because they're happening online. So, um, you know, if you're creating a traditional government data instrument, um, then uh, you're tracking big categories and you don't want them to change very often because you have to build it by a survey. The idea is that you could never possibly see all of the hiring that's going on. Right. Um, but the internet changed all that, just like it changed so much else. And so we started saying, well, look, we can go out and scrape literally millions of job openings every day. Um, and once you have them, you could actually read them um, and say specifically who's hiring for what, not only what roles, but what skills, um, what credentials are they looking for? And that's been really, really important for a number of things um, in helping uh, companies plan for uh, their talent. Um, So first of all, from a talent acquisition perspective, right, okay, um, it starts to give us a sense of who, you know, with whom are we competing, um, who is likely to have a workforce that's invested with kind of skills that we're looking for. Um, But what it also did is it gave us um, a sense, broadly us, right, of um, what are the skills that are, are changing work? What are the skills that are becoming valuable? Um, if you look at the kinds of um, sectors that are on the leading edge, if you look at the companies that are kind of bellwethers, um, the geographies that, that tend to be out in front, you can start to see certain sets of skills um, reshaping work Um, growing super fast, driving significant premiums. Um, And so that's been really important for strategic workforce planning because you can start to actually look ahead and not just say, okay, oh my gosh, you know, the hiring managers are saying they need people with these skills. Oh, wish we could train from within, but we need them now. Now you can actually start to make L&D into R&D. Right. I love that line. That's great. I feel like 
part of the challenge, just as you're as you're talking about it, is it's not just about forecasting the types of job openings you need, but really training your people and giving that information to workers themselves to also take care uh, take charge of their own careers. So one of the ways that Burning Glass Institute is doing that is um, with your most recent piece of one of your most recent pieces of research, which is the State of Skills Report. Um, so for our listeners, if you're not familiar, the report analyzed hundreds of millions of job postings in the U.S. dating back to 2015. Um, seems like yesterday sometimes, but it was a fair, fair bit ago. Um, and it found that the most in-demand skills were cloud skills, social media skills, and project management skills with AI skills at the very top. Uh, what stood out to you from the data in the report? So first of all, um, you know, I think what to me... Um, stood out most is is really the breadth of demand for these skills mm -hmm. um, so we define these skills as the skills that are growing the fastest and spreading the widest right um, and so you know when you think about something like ai or ml right it still feels even with all the talk about gen ai and actually we undertook that piece of research before um, right. like a month before Gen AI got uh, unleashed on the world. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you sort of think about those as being really technical capabilities, mm -hmm. um, cloud computing likewise, um, even things like uh, product management or uh, data analytics or, or social media. You know, a lot of these felt like technical capabilities. And yet we saw them across hundreds of industries, um, across any major geography. Um, you know, if you look overall, I think it was something like one in one in eight jobs overall needs one of those core, one of those kind of disruptive skills, one of those sets of of um, skills that are, are spreading the fa fast, they're growing the fastest and spreading the, the, the widest. Um, and that's one in five in manufacturing, right? So yeah. we think of, again, AI as on the, the this kind of bleeding edge. Actually, it's 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 already been here and it's, um, you know, and, and it's, and it's already been reshaping work in, in meaningful ways. Um, even in government, um, which I think a lot of people tend to assume is kind of lagging in its capabilities, um, specifically and particularly on the tech side, you know, one in 10 jobs needed one of these capabilities. So that says that this is, um, this set of skills are gonna be increasingly critical Right. To defining jobs, to defining people's readiness for work, and to defining which companies are and which organizations are, are most, uh, you know, are, are, are most ready for work. I think that makes a lot of sense when you when you think about um, the the challenges that workers have in trying to even fill some of these job openings. I mean, what's the takeaway for workers? What does that mean for people working in these jobs where? You know, how much does it impact the employer as much as it does the person who's executing it? So I think there's um, there's both a, um, a a risk and an opportunity here for workers. Mm -hmm. um, the risk, uh, of course, what happens if you you aren't acquiring those sets of new skills that are increasingly right. not just defining occupational spe uh, specialties, but are actually defining the job that you're probably already working in right. and the opportunity. Um, which is uh, how much value you can unlock in your career if you get ahead of the game. Um, and, and so worth sort of unpacking each of those. Um, in terms of that risk, um, I'll, I'll put it this way, and this is a risk, by the way, that's shared by employers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, uh, part of what we, of the analysis that we did in that report, built in some work that we did together with, uh, with the Boston Consulting Group, uh, we found that the average job has seen across all occupations has seen um, 37 percent of its uh, top skills replaced just in the last five years you sort of think about how astounding that is That's think wild. by the way like if you're an lnd leader like is 37 percent of my learning catalog changed in the last uh five years i'm, I'm going to guess probably not right yes um, and so for a worker that says that this isn't just um you know couple of tech jobs again that, that maybe need some new skills um, every buddy in every job is going to need new sets of skills to stay current 
Right. Um, and that sounds maybe kind of hyperbolized, mm -hmm. um, but uh, first of all, worth pointing out, right? When you think about their 37% was an average. So the jobs that are being um, most transformed, that top quartile, it was actually 76% of the skills were different. Wow. Um, and that's incredible. Bottom, isn't it? Like it's, it's breathtaking. It's sort of that, unbelievable if you think I, about I know, it. But, right? Like, you know, yeah. if it weren't like for the fact that we pulled a lot of data, I wouldn't believe right. it. Um, the bottom uh, quartile was kind of uh, a lot of tended to be more low wage construction, right. transportation, those kinds of, of occupations. Um, but the other thing to bear in mind here is that if you were um, so, you know, this is affecting all, all sorts of jobs. Um, but if you're in a job and you're not acquiring new skills, Look, I think it's easy to look at this and say, well, it's not, you know, people have always needed new skills. And that's probably true. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's been a significant acceleration. Right. Um, but the reality is, is that most people don't necessarily get fired for not having the skills they need. But if they do get displaced, there's a lot of research that shows um, that people who, uh, that's when you really kind of um, feel, you know, kind of feel the brunt of it. Right. Uh, because employers want to hire for what they need in the future, not what they've needed in the past. Right. Um, and so that puts workers at significant risk. It puts workforces at significant risk as well. Right. You know, for, for L and D leaders, one of the things we have to worry about is, is the workforce that we have able to be the workforce that we need? Yes. Um, but here's why I think there's a big opportunity here. Um, and again, this is an opportunity for workers and it's an opportunity for companies as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's this. In When you see the pace of growth that um, we're seeing here and when we're seeing that a lot of the new skills that people need to acquire are um, ones that hybridize different fields that haven't tended to travel together. Think about marketing people who suddenly need the data skills to be able to manipulate customer data when most of the marketing people you know are kind of right brain people, mm -hmm. right? When you sort of start to see those kinds of changes take place, the people who can be out front in acquiring those skills are in the catbird seat in the job market. The companies, the organizations whose work, you know, who have a workforce that can be uh, invested with those future ready skills those companies are likewise, um, you know, far ahead competitively right. in terms of what they can accomplish relative to firms whose workforces are further behind. So having our antennae up um, to be able to see those changes in, in real time um, is uh, tremendously important because it allows us the time to react. I love the way that you phrase that. I think one of the challenges when we talk about this sometimes is that it's such a process oriented and like top down approach of we need to do an audit of skills within the company and think five years out to what skills we might need. And um, what you're saying is not necessarily no to that, but how can we also look at the job openings that are are already coming out, not just within your own company, but across the industry um, and sort of you know, positioning yourselves among competitors even to see what everyone else is doing and, and really what are the, um, the transformational skill sets that everyone is going to need at some, in some capacity. It reminds me of um, something that I heard when I started working in this space um, a little over six years ago, and it was something like, you know, there's no such thing as um, a digital job, like every job will dis to, uh, require digital skills. Um, so it's it's interesting how some of that just becomes table stakes after a certain point in time. By the way, we're seeing the same thing with green right now. Mm. People go through all sorts of gymnastics to try to figure out which jobs are green jobs. And, right. you know, I'll give you an example. If you're a network engineer, um, you know, network, I think most of us wouldn't look at a network engineer and say, hey, that's a green job. But increasingly, we're seeing um, network engineers who need to understand power conservation. Um, right. right. It's given just like the nature of these huge machines that they're and 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 uh, cloud servers and whatever that they're leveraging. Um, 
well, now you're starting to see people having to leverage and integrate green sets of skills. So very much the same idea. And, and I, by the way, I just, I think this, um, uh, this point you made is such an important one about um, timeliness, right? So, right. you know, it's easy to, when we're trying to plan out our workforce for five years from now, it's easy to throw up our hands in the air and just say like, hey, this is, this is kind of too academic. Like who's got that crystal ball? And, and right. you know it would be right. Yeah, um, it's worth going through the exercise. It's but but the reality is that there are enough signals out there um, that we can, you know we don't necessarily need to be in the bleeding edge. We can be fast followers. Yes. Um, yeah. And you know if we can say, hey, look, here's things that we can say, you know, coming soon to a theater near you, <laughs> um, right? Um, and be able to plan for them. That's how we make sure that. L and D can actually be a core mechanism right. for preparing the workforce. Because, like I said before, so often I think a lot of companies have the right intentionality of wanting to invest in their workforce, wanting yeah. to invest in the training that makes um, their workforce ready. But they then get stuck with, oh my gosh, like we need people with Gen AI skills, and where are we going to find them? Okay, we're going to rip and replace. Right. Um, if you can anticipate those changes really quickly and start planning for them, you've got you've got the six months, you've got the year. Yes, to start absolutely. Um, planning for what you're going to need. Absolutely, and I think it's it's also this feeling of we have to start things from scratch every single time. Like this is the skill that must be upcoming. Well, we need something bespoke because you know our industry is completely different, and um, sometimes that's the case. But there's cer there's certainly a case to be made, I imagine, for plug and play content that can be adapted um, as you see fit for for the needs that are there. Of course, the conversation within a tech company will be very different from the one in manufacturing. But Gen AI is Gen AI, um, so <laughs> what you talk about there will be um, at least at a baseline, the same sort of thing. So one of the things that you talked about at the beginning was, you know, the opportunity that exists for workers um, and, you know, thinking a little bit more broadly about what sort of almost the social contract is between the employer and the employee. Um, I wanted to talk to you about another um, research uh, piece that you've got, which is called the American Opportunity Index. I would love for you to tell me a little bit about that and what it is that the index does. Fabulous. Well, the American Opportunity Index is something that that um, we think really um, changes the game in terms of how we can help companies evaluate uh, worker experience um, mm -hmm. and to do that at scale. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of work that's been done thus far sort of relies on sentiment surveys um, or you get to things that try to evaluate job quality by looking at the inputs, you know, um, what kind of benefits people get and do they have flexibility and time off? Those things are super important to employees, to how they progress. Um, but what we tried to do with the Opportunity Index, together with our colleagues at um, the Harvard Business School um, and at the Schultz Family Foundation, was to instead look at what happens to workers um, and how being at a given company um, changes their trajectory. So it grows out of uh, some past work that we had done where we looked at um, how people move up from what are often called poverty trap jobs. And we found that a lot of, um, you know, there's a number of factors, you know, when you switch, how, what fields you switch that play out. But one of the ones that seemed to have the biggest impact on people's upward mobility uh, was the specific company you work for. So you could have two workers in the exact same job at two directly competing firms who have entirely different prospects for whether or not they move up. And so the Opportunity Index uh, measured uh, the Fortune 500 based upon uh, the trajectory of, of their workers, um, be able to understand which companies uh, uh, were doing the most to create opportunity for their workers, not based on, again, kind of their practices, but based on what actually happens to their workers. So we tra we followed millions of their, of their workers, um, and specifically workers working in jobs that don't require college degrees, um, to see what 
uh, how they progressed um, over over a five year period, um, and we saw very significant differences. Um, the you know we we measured um, the access the companies gave to opportunity. We measured um, the amount of upward mobility that companies exp- uh, that sorry workers experience. So can you get on the ladder? Can you move up the ladder? Uh, we measured the earnings uh, that people have. Do you, are you making enough to stay on the ladder? Um, as we move toward releasing, by the way, this fall, um, the 2023 index, we also are looking at, uh, at questions of fairness or people moving up the ladder equally um, and some measures of worker experience. Um, what we found is that these measures really do distinguish companies. So, um, you know, if you think about even something as basic as pay, we think that a given role, right, pay is is going to be fairly commoditized. Well, the people um, at top quintile companies in terms of how much they pay overall, we're earning on uh, typically about two and a half times what people at bottom quintile companies are making. Uh, the companies, uh, you know, companies who were leading on promote on, uh, on upward mobility, their workers are about 60% more likely to, to get promotions. Um, list goes on from there. So, um, you know, what we found is that companies really do have a very significant impact on whether or not their workers are rising. Yeah. And I think what differentiates that from what you're talking about is it's it's not just the uh, the marketing speak, if you will, but it's the... Uh, the scoring is based so much on um, economic indicators that center on the worker themselves. Um, and it's not just a few stories of success here and there, but it sounds like uh, there's things that are embedded in the culture that are then passed on through you know, the work that managers do as well um, to support their direct reports and move them up. You know, my uh, my co-author in this work, Joe Fuller at, at Harvard Business School, um, has done some past work um, where he uh, studied, he surveyed, um, you know, a, a large number of, of, uh, of HR leaders, um, of hiring managers and of workers and, right. uh, and, and asked them about, uh, you know, kind of who uh, asked the HR leaders, you know, what practices they had in place, then asked the workers the same, like, you know, hey. And mm-hmm. uh, the the differences between their responses were night and day. Really? Um, I don't think that there was any lack of sincerity on mm. the part of the HR leaders. But to your point about um, marketing speak, we, we all know what kind of pro- uh, programs we've implemented. Right. We don't really actually have a good way of knowing um, were they implemented well? Were they signposted from uh, employees? Um, how um, how high quality are they? Um, how integrated are they into a range of processes inside the company? And so when we designed the Opportunity Index, our goal was to create a yardstick. Um, yeah. It's not that the practices don't matter, quite the opposite. What we wanted to do was to give companies a tool for being able to evaluate um, whether their practices are are moving the needle and specifically which of their practices are moving the needle. Yeah. I like the way that you phrased it also in the opportunity index about, about those, you call them categories of opportunity creation. Um, so things like career launch pad, career stability, career growth, um, you know, having seen this space for a little bit of time, so often it is really focused on what the top down approach is and, exactly as you mentioned at the top, here are our benefits, here's our, our competitive compensation, here's all of the things we give to you for the privilege of joining our company. But this is really focused on um, that ladder and, and making sure that it is more equal. So we're really looking forward to seeing that next report in the fall. I, I like, um, I appreciate that you, you called out also said how we broke out some of those different mm-hmm. kind of a, archetypes, if you will, of, right. of uh, opportunity creation. It was it, something that we felt was really important to do because, you know, look, if you're using a sing, you know, if you get too single minded and you say, okay, well, all we're going to care about here is, is upward mobility. You see a lot of companies um, that are actually great places to work mm-hmm. um, that aren't going to, to come out near the top. Um, right. Actually, almost inherently, if you're a kind of company that nobody ever wants to leave, 
um, and then unless the company's great, growing crazy fast, then inherently people are going to be moving up a lot slower than at some, uh, some other companies. Right. So what we wanted to do was to recognize that there's very different models for how companies support their workers. Mm -hmm. And those speak to different kinds of practices. So a company that is a great launch pad, uh, right, that is not tons of upward opportunity at the company, but they're really good at investing people with skills and capabilities and they leave and go to better jobs, you're going to have a different learning strategy right. than if you're a company which has high levels of um, internal promotion versus if you're a company where there's a good amount of stability. You're, you're probably not moving people up the chain very much, but you're getting people become more and more expert in their own jobs. Each of those is a different strategy. Um, and so thinking that there's a single set of, uh, of metrics here would be inappropriate. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And it differentiates it so much from some of the other indices that exist because there's an ability for, I think, more flexibility um, in measuring success and defining what success looks like. So if a company doesn't grade as highly or doesn't score as well on the opportunity index, you know, what, what do they, what could they really do to improve? What are some specific actions they could potentially take to turn their score around? So, so I, I think, um, as those companies, um, try to take a page from the companies that are leading, Right. Um, here's what um, I suggest they focus on. The companies, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of companies, at least nominally, have similar sets of practices. Right. Um, there are a couple of things, though, that stood out among top level companies. One is that they were really good at signposting um, the kinds of programs that they had um, for so that employees really knew that they were there. Um, you know, it's, it's great to have a program, but employees need to know about it. And those, that often means not just kind of having a, an email that goes out from HR that says, Hey, you know, take a look at a, this program. You should do that too. But often it meant, you know, how do we embed that, for example, in, in the internal review, pro, in the performance review process or, or things like that? How do we create sets of development mentors? How do we train up our own hiring uh, hiring managers or managers themselves to be able to coach um, employees more effectively and point them toward resources that are available. Yeah. The broader thing that really distinguished companies that are at the top um, is that um, they were able to see their, uh, their existing workforce as being a pipeline of talent for where they were going to need mm. uh, people in the future. That sounds kind of obvious. Well, of course, you know, as we, you know, uh, as we have a sets of jobs that are going to need to be filled, we're going to want to look inside the company to be able to fill them. But it's actually really hard. It's really hard to look at something, buddy, not as the job that she's doing, but as the job that she could be doing. Mm -hmm. It's hard to look at somebody who's um, a, a treasury uh, analyst and say she actually could be a cybersecurity analyst. Um, right. Two jobs that actually have a fair amount in common. Um, right. That's, that's, that takes a different kind of culture. And I'd say, you know, for companies that are looking to, um, to, you know, kind of boost how they support their workers in rising, um, I think that's where I'd start. Right. I like the way that you describe that because I think it also speaks to the fact that, um, you know, although we talked about at the beginning, you don't want to necessarily only focus on that forward looking journey of what skills your company needs. At the end of the day, you also need to think about um, doing some level of quantification with every person within the company um, for the skills that their job tasks require mm -hmm. and the skills uh, that they maybe naturally bring to the position based on their experience. And, you know, you hear this sometimes in career coaching about this strengths-based approach um, borrowing from, from Gallup and this idea that, you know, there's some things that you can naturally bring and maybe you weren't even recruited for that. So it's a, it's a challenging thing sometimes to try to do that on a larger scale, especially the bigger, um, you know, employee count that you get. How do you really quantify any of that? 
you know, when we're um, working with companies, one of the things that, that we do is look at um, this intersection between um, what are the skills that, um, that affect good transitions mm. uh, or, or sort of put a different way. What are the, what are the adjacencies in skills between skills of a given talent pool and the skills you're trying to fill right. and the actual actually observed transitions. Um, and very often you can uncover non-obvious uh, potential transitions when you put those two methods together, right? You can find ones where um, on the one side, we're seeing some places where actually there's, who knew, right? But there's actually a lot of people who are making that transition right now, even though it's a transition that might not make a lot of sense on paper, how do we make sure we're giving those employees more support and more visibility? And then conversely, there's sets of transitions where, um, you know, there's a lot of logic to it. And yet we're right. not seeing those transitions getting made today. Um, and those two kinds of uh, uh, quadrants, if you will, hold a lot of opportunity for how you can uncover uh, uh, hidden talent pools. That's really interesting. I've heard that described from a higher education perspective in terms of looking at the specific you know, skills that are maybe included in course material and the difference between you know, an engineering profession and um, some kind of like rocket science um, degree. I'm not doing it justice by explaining it that way. But um, I wonder how you tell that story on the employer side, because it feels like it's almost a different type of skill set um, that L&D professionals might need to be developing, which is to, to be able to see those linkages and really to leverage the real-time labor market information to, uh, to really be able to tell that story. So one of the things that I think is going to be critical to the L&D professional of the future is the ability to start from, um, from demand. Um, right. Because of the nature of what um, the L&D profession does, which is help people develop, um, we tend to sort of lock in on the supply side, if you will, just to sound kind of um, economist nerdy here for a second, <laughs> uh, right? You know, we tend to start with uh, the worker and say, okay, how do we help that worker develop? Right. But very often, one of the most effective things we can do is say, okay, if we know that there's going to be sets of, uh, of roles that are going to become challenging to fill. If we know there's sets of skills that are going to be really important. Um, what, what are the capability sets that are going to be needed and where can we find them inside mm -hmm. the company? Um, that also means, by the way, that talent professionals um, need to become uh, the source of insight for the company in terms of what talent is actually inside the company. Um, that right. sounds kind of obvious, right? That of course the talent function should know what our talent base looks like, what our workforce skills are. Um, but I think most of us would acknowledge that actually all, many companies have very little idea of who works for them. Uh, yeah. People's titles, they know, you know, kind of, they used to know where you sit, um, probably not anymore. Right. Uh, and, you know, they probably know your tax ID number and how much they pay you. <laughs> but, you know, beyond that, actually, at an aggregated level, most companies really don't know what skills reside in each function and, and with each individual. There's a lot of buzzy systems that are out there today, which are professing to capture that, but they depend on people actually profiling themselves. And right. you know, that only sometimes happens, right? But if you can start to create a workforce map, you can more effectively inventory skills. And when you can do that, you can then say, okay, we know that we're going to need these sets of skills here. Where inside the organization are some of those skills today? And people who are in those functions, what skills do they have? What skills do they not yet have? And how do we create the programs that bridge those gaps very efficiently and specifically? Yeah, it's interesting that you mention, you know, companies that might not have a good idea of what's there. I mean, I know you've got tons of stories from the Opportunity Index itself, but I wonder if there are, are examples. I'm trying to think of, of some examples, but there, there are some instances where um, given digital transformation, 
you're looking at people who might have been in frontline jobs that are doing very like manual and repetitive tasks. And you're seeing the types of skill sets that they have very differently because there's a whole bundle of tasks that they're completing or changing. So one example that comes to mind is Ikea. Um, understand that they're retraining their call center staff to become um, remote interior design advisors cool. um, because it hands off a growing share of routine customers um, customer queries to an AI bot. So it's figuring out uh, the types of things they might be doing um, in, in some of those calls and, and doing things differently. And I mean, I don't know that you would ever uh, be able to, to think that way and make that segue had you not thought, okay, how do we actually serve um, this new customer expectation that's coming up and and doing things like that? I wonder if you have additional examples to share from the opportunity index or just from your own reading. I, I think um, you know there's there's dozens of them um, you know of of various people who can step up into a data science role or or into um, uh, you know, I give you the example of four of, of people in treasury who can move into cybersecurity because mm -hmm. they've got the ability to audit processes and um, and to investigate inc incidents, excuse me. Right. Um, you know, one uh, example of, of a set of transitions that, that we've seen bear out um, that seem kind of surprising, but I think kind of illustrate the power of being able to help people advance step by step uh, is... Uh, of retail people moving into tech. Um, right. Not a huge percentage of retail people who move into tech, um, but it's it's non-trivial. It's like a few percent. Um, if you look at what happens over five years, and the first time I looked at that, I said, okay, well, these must be the people who are kind of working their way through college or something like that, and and that's that's what we're seeing. Actually, more often, it's I'm working uh, at Best Buy um, selling consumer electronics. I get a little bit of training. I move to, um, setting up consumer electronics at, at Best Buy. I get, you know, a plus certification, a little more training and I'm working, moving to a help desk job. Right. And so I think when we start to see those kinds of steps, um, there's, uh, you know, kind of a lot of, it opens things up much broader because it says that, um, people, have much more ability right. to move and to be repositioned than we may think. When we're thinking about um, transitions as requiring people to uh, leap tall buildings in a single bound, right? Then our uh, the scope of opportunity is actually limited. That's that's scope of opportunity for workers, but it's also the scope to leverage our workforces more effectively. When we can start to think about how do we do this progressively. Um, in a step-by-step -step way, um, then there's a big swaths of our workforce that we can unlock. There's whole new sets of opportunities that we can can make available to people. Yeah, I like that so much. I, I think that that speaks to um, the whole you know sort of gamut of people that are within an organization that are responsible for what we would maybe traditionally title human resources. Um, Maybe it's something like people and culture or talent and <laughs> leadership or, or whatever it's called internally. Um, but it, it feels like it's, it's a focus on people, what they bring it to the table, what they could potentially bring to the table with, with additional skills training. Um, your example of retail also reminded me of um, Palette Skills, which is a national nonprofit that we've got up here in Canada. And they actually started out with one uh, program called Sales Camp. Um, and that was actually looking at people who primarily worked in the restaurant industry, um, bartenders, for example, mm -hmm. um, who expressed an interest in moving into technology sales um, because you're working with people all day long um, trying to, to sell them drinks. <laughs> so why couldn't that same skill set be applied in a completely different setting if there was interest there? So I think that's really interesting. I think one of the things that you were talking before about um, AI impacts and, mm -hmm. you know, we've been starting to do some work looking at um, how those bear out. Um, I think a lot of the work that's been done to date is just kind of looking at um, the percentage of a job's tasks that are going to get replaced. And yep. then you sort of aggregate those up and you wind up with some dire projections. And um, I'm a lot um, more optimistic. Um, yeah. And the reason is 
that what you start to see there is the skills that are left inside jobs. Right. Um, and very often, this isn't true universally, but in a lot of jobs, those job, those skills that are left are the high value skills. Right. And inherently what that says is that um, we're actually, by making the work more efficient, um, you're going to create more demand, not less. Right. Um, so there's a, a whole set of jobs where we're going to be able to um, use data in ways that just aren't affordable today. And so as a result, you know, kind of more need for people to do that or think about in the, 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 um, the L&D uh, and talent world, right? the ability to provide exactly as you described this really high level of personalization, mm-hmm. just something that would never work today because it costs too much. Right. But when you can start to be much more um, prescriptive, um, when much more of the function can take place um, in a model driven way, then you can deploy people on some of the highest value things that the kind right. of things that L&D professionals have always wanted to do. Right. And as those you know develop, we can all become fast followers, as you said. Um, Matt, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, we like to leave our listeners with something tangible to end with. So you've said that the workforce you have can be the workforce you need for the future. I love that line. Um, but only if you invest in worker skills. So uh, to end, what steps can learning and development leaders take away to implement in their near term uh, to get started on this? So I, I think this comes back to the idea of looking um, a year out to demand mm-hmm. um, and saying, okay, if I can plan 12 to 18 months from now, if I could, could figure out what are the sets of, of jobs and skills that are going to be more important to my organization, and then figure out which parts of my workforce could become those, you can then start to budget for, uh, for L&D to be R&D. You can structure L&D to be R&D. And you can make sure that you're creating an effective pipeline of talent um, and not wind up in the situation where um, you really wish you could, but there's no way that you can meet that timeline. And I think people uh, have more time than they think Mm -hmm. um, as long as they are being um, very focused about uh, anticipating trends, again, not multi years out, but 12 to 18 months out, and creating the structures that um, both build worker awareness of those opportunities, um, that create high efficiency programs that can take people from the jobs they're in to the jobs that are going to represent greater opportunity for them and greater value for the company. That's great. I love that so much. I I feel like I'm going to include that in our forward-looking thought leadership. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Matt, for your time. So enjoy this. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Skill Shift. This episode was produced by D2L, a global learning innovation company, helping organizations reshape the future of education and work. You can find links to the resources we discussed in this episode on our website, d2l.com. There you'll also find the video version of this podcast, related content, and more. You can also find other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you for joining us.